Good morning, or good afternoon. Today is uh, 8 August, the year 2007. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum, along with special guest, Wendy Solomon. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Tech Sergeant Bernie Milliben. Sergeant Milliben was a mechanic with the uh, 70, 771st Tank Battalion in Europe during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Bernie, nice to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Okay. Thanks for having me. Well, our pleasure. Now, um, first of all, would you uh, repeat and spell your full name for us, please? Sure. My name is Bernard. My friends call me Bernie. Okay. H. Milliband, M-I-L-I-B-A-N-D. And when and where were you born? I was born in the Bronx. July 25th, 1922. And I assume the Bronx is in New York City. The Bronx, New York City, you're correct. Okay, a Yankee fan, and I assume. I, I lived there for about uh, 18 years, uh -huh. and then I moved to New Jersey. Oh, okay. Well, let's, let, okay, let's, let's, let's stick with New York for sure. the time being. Uh, what was your father's name? Philip. And what did he do? My dad was an embroidery uh, designer and operator in downtown New York with his uh, dad and his brothers. They were all in business together. And they had their uh, shop on 22nd, East 22nd Street. And I had that up until the time of the, when the crash came along and the depression both at the same time. And they literally lost everything they had. The banks shut the door in their face. They could not get to their bank account. And, Consequently, couldn't pay people off at that point, although my dad and his father and brother were very, very uh, reliable people and went to work and paid everybody everything they owed them. It took them years and years to do that, but we suffered the consequence at home because we didn't have any money. And uh, I grew up in a very, very poor house, and again, it was a depression, and we lived on what we called at that time home relief. They didn't call it welfare, where people gathered together and gave us food once every two weeks. My brother and I would go down and collect packages of food and bring it home to my mother. I, at 10 years old, decided that maybe I could make a few dollars, so I was shining shoes on the weekend. And I used to turn that money into my mother, which was about $3 for a whole weekend, which she took that $3 and lasted for about a whole week. I used it, kept about 25 cents of it for whatever I did with it. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> And I had to get up 4 o'clock in the morning to put my box out in front of a, a, an appetizing store and a bakery store where the men on Sunday morning would frequent about 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the morning, and it was a choice spot. You had to have that spot because when they came out of the store, you would ask if they wanted to have a shine in their shoes. And the shine at that time was 5 cents, and when they gave me a dime, I thought I was in seventh heaven. So. Uh, was there competition? Were there other shoes? Yes, there, guys were, there was, some, there was two, two boys, two other boys. They were friends of mine. Uh -huh. And sometimes they'd get the spot in front of the store if they came <laughs> early than I did. Or, or I would. Sometimes I'd put my box out and go home, go back to sleep, and come back and find the box was still there. Uh -huh. It was nothing but an orange crate. Yeah. And I had a little shoe box. <laughs> and uh, that's what I did. I did that for a couple of years, actually. And I didn't have many jobs in my life. I went to work at a, as a delivery boy in a butcher store. And I then started to make about 3 or $4 a week. And all I could eat, which was the important part, <laughs> because they used to cut up ham and sausages and feed the help. And that was the important part for me. And I did that. Yeah. And then uh, somewhere about when I was 14, I got very lucky. A friend of mine, my mother's, I should say, recommended me to a nice man downtown who had a machine shop. And he took an interest in me and he liked me and so he started to train me and teach me to work on engine lathes and turret lathes and milling machines and grinders and I had to stand, I was so small I had to stand on a box in order to reach everything. And I really took a liking to that and I decided that, that might be something I want to do someday. 
So I went to school and went to a vocational school, and I went to SAT, that's School of Aviation Trades, downtown New York. And then I went to a regular school to uh, Van the Childs in the Bronx. And I left the school in my last year, I left the school the last quarter to go to work because this man wanted me to start working full time and I finished school at night. And then I worked for him until I was almost 18 years old. And I went to work for uh, Western Electric, which was AT&T over in Kearney, New Jersey. At the same time, I enrolled myself in a school called, uh, that was, uh, oh gosh, can't think of it. I'll think of it in a second. It was in Pennsylvania. And I, I took mathematics and uh, tool design and engineering. And we got very lucky because uh, the telephone company also sent me to school in their own private school for mathematics and also drafting. And I became quite good on, in the machine shop and worked myself up to become a First I became a uh, setup man, a foreman, then I became a supervisor. And I st stayed there and that was my good stroke of luck because we worked on something very little known, was just developing, was called radar. And because I worked on radar, I had gotten three six month deferments. And when, they, when the uh, Senate finally passed a law saying that nobody under 26 could, could be deferred anymore, uh, a guy by the name of Enoch came down to my draft board here in, uh, well, there in uh, the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, made a personal plea for me, told them how important I was to the operation of the war effort, and they gave him another three more months for me. So in reality, I was deferred about 21 months, and I didn't get into the Army till, till late in the war itself. Okay. okay, let's back and I want to fill in some of the gaps here. That, that, that's a good overall view up until your wartime experiences. But I want to go back and talk to you a little bit about, first of all, your father again. Oh, where did he, uh, his family ancestors come from? Where, where uh, from the old country? My where? dad and his family were born in Warsaw, Poland, and they, most of the family migrated to France. His whole family left and went to France. Would have been uh, about like what year, more or less? I would have had to be around uh, mm, probably about 1906. Uh, and do you and know that, why they? Why they? Yes, they they didn't like the. They were having problem over there with, in Russia, and many of them were worried about uh, different things that the Russians were doing to them, and so they settled. Most of them settled in Brussels and uh, Paris, and uh, ultimately the whole family settled over there. Uh, my dad then, at uh, 12 years old, was taken to America by his, his dad, and so he came here rather young. And what, is it, what, was, what did his father do? His, his father was in the same business as he was. Embroidery. Embroidery. Yeah. Okay. They did embroidery. Okay. And your mother, uh, what was her name and her My mother's name? name was Lillian, and she came from Vienna, Austria, and she came here when she was two years old, and also settled downtown New York. Uh, somewhere on the east side. And what was her maiden name? Her, her real, real name was Tarbis, T-A-R-B-I-S, but she had been adopted by a family by the name of Seldis, S-E-L-D-I-S. And uh, they raised her until she was 16 when she finally found out through means of uh, school children that she was really adopted and went and found her real family. Uh, so she could have written a book on that all by itself. Okay. Because now, where was her real family? They all lived in Yonkers, New York, oh, up, up in York, Westchester County. So did she go live with them then, or did she stay No, uh, but she was married in her father's house. He was a wealthy man, and he had abandoned his wife and five children to marry another lady and raised three more kids, all of them being very, very well-educated, schooled in Europe and America. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother then got to meet all her sisters because there were three girls. Okay. And where did your mom and dad meet? They met in the building. My mother worked on a lower level and my dad worked a couple of levels up and he had to pass by the window where my mother used to work and finally one day got up the nerve to say hello to her and talk to her and they struck up a friendship and courted each other for about almost three years and then got married. You have any brothers and sisters? I had a brother who was two years older than I. He's dead since 1981. He was 63 years old. And what was his name? His name was Herbert. 
and Herbert worked for the Herbie. He worked for the government. He was an inspector. He had a A and E license, aircraft and engineer, and he took care of uh, the whole state of New Jersey as far as safety was concerned. Whereas he would work in these uh, plants that were had government work to make sure that uh, the plant was safe enough for a government employee to be there. Prior to that, before he even got up to that age, he was working for Glenn L. Martin, Lockheed, uh, Grumman, and he worked at all the aircraft companies. Very, very bright young man. Was he in World War in the service during World no. War? No, he was. He was. He was uh, eliminated. He was given a furlough. I mean, uh, a deferment. Uh, yeah, okay. deferment because of his job. So. And do you remember the, uh, the the home that you lived that you grew up when you grew up where you lived? Well, we lived in many homes. We were, it was just apartment houses, and I say many because my folks were so poor they had to keep on moving to, in order to get a month's worth of concession or two months worth of concession. So my mom and dad just moved from one place to another because they couldn't afford the rent, and they were all in the Bronx. That's really where I grew up. And what did you kids do for fun when you were growing up? What's that? What did you kids, you guys do for fun when you were growing up, you kids? Oh, we played what they call stick ball out in the street. We played a little black ball, a handball in a schoolyard. Uh, skated an awful lot. Finally uh, got enough money to buy a bicycle and then got with my transportation beside my skates. Go to the store with my mom on my skates on my bike. And uh, we just played what they call ring levy and or just what kids game that you'd play out in the street. Because there were no cars there, you didn't have to worry about a car. The, the, the gutter, as we called it, was yours, and we played marbles alongside the whole curb. And uh, if we ever saw a car park, they were wondering who owns that car. Because we're now talking about, you know, 1929, 1930, 31, so nobody had cars. And was it kind of an ethnic neighborhood that you lived in? It was predominantly Jewish, but very well mixed with Italian and, uh, and uh, we had several black people, and we were all friends. Nobody ever knew who was black or who was white. It was a wonderful thing. I had friends like that and never knew the difference between one to another. I grew up that way. Did you follow any sports teams in the New York teams? No, I like never it? did. I, a basketball, I shouldn't say that. I played basketball as a kid uh -huh. in a community house that uh, used to send me to camp every summer. They sent these kids that had no money to camp, and we played. They were called the Knights. K-N-I-G-H-T-S, and we played basketball for about five years with other, other competing with other local... Uh, was it like the Knights of Columbus or something like that? that had no, no, it was just, just, called just called the Knights, yeah. Uh, it was just a, it was a, it was called the Bronx House, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bronx House let kids form clubs and belong there, and we called ourselves the Knights. I, I don't know who put the name on us, but that's what it was. And was your family very religious? Did you go to services no. and stuff a lot? Or? No, they were they were middle of the road. They went to synagogue on high holy days. That was about it. So I never had a real, I was bar mitzvah, but I never had a real real religious background. Well, tell me about that. That's that's pretty uh, pretty strenuous, isn't it? I mean, as far as learning all, all this stuff when you get a book. Yes, it is, and uh, I did that. And uh, I finally, when I was in, my married life, when I early married life, and my children came along, we decided that we wanted to go back to the temple. So we lived at this point now, we're living in Paramus, New Jersey, and there was no temple in that particular town that was suitable to me because the temple that was there was ultra religious and orthodox, and that wasn't my brand of religion. So about six of us decided that we were going to start a temple. So we started a reformed temple. It's called Temple Bethor. And we built that temple into a wonderful temple of a couple of hundred families. Built the building, and we started to meet originally in J.C. Penny. From J.C. Penny, we met in the local Paramus Firehouse. And from the firehouse, we built this building in Washington Township, which is a neighboring town alongside of, a, of a Paramus. And I went through the chairs and finally became president of the temple and so on. My kids grew up there, and they, they were Bat Mitzvah and Bar Mitzvah confirmed, and we, we liked temple life. We stayed with the temple 25 years until we came out to Palm Springs and joined the local temple out here, which is Temple Isaiah, right. yeah. and had a wonderful relationship with Temple Isaiah, being their president for five years really? also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that was my religious background, and uh, I, would not, I can't say that I'm a, a 
ultra-religious person, but I, I believe in the Supreme Being, actually. And so I believe in the Lord, there's somebody up there watching over us, and I don't believe that everybody has their own God, I just believe there's somebody serving the whole world. That's my, I choose to be that way. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense to me. Um, now, did you go to a number of grammar schools, grade schools, or? I just went to Evander Childs at School of Aviation Trades. Okay. Just two of them. I finished the last year in uh, Roosevelt High. Roosevelt High. Now, what year was that? When did? When 1940. That 1940. Yeah. Now, tell me, do you remember what you were doing on December 7th, 1941? Yeah. I was driving down the West Side Highway with three friends of mine in a car we'd had, and this this uh, bulletin came over the air about some place in Pearl Harbor that got bombed, and we didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. We didn't even know it belonged to America. We didn't know anybody. We kind of looked at each other. We were all about the same age, 18. And I was wondering, now, where is this anyway? And then as the news evolved and we started hearing different things, we realized what was going on. And uh, it was pretty scary. Were you up on current affairs? Did you know what was going on over in Europe and, and even the Far not, East? Not really. I didn't, I didn't realize that the Jewish people had been incarcerated, that they were being put in concentration camps. I knew of Hitler. I was aware of Hitler and I was aware of him storming throughout all of Eastern Europe and then Europe and, and taking one country after another. It was frightening. And at this time I had already uh, gone on 19. I, I started to work for the phone company, Bell Labs, and uh, we had to paint our windows black because we took over the old Ford building out in Kearney, New Jersey, and we were doing this very strategic defense work. At that time, it was just called for war effort. And then we finally got into the war when we got attacked, which was some time later. And uh, that was when Pearl Harbor happened. So, so But I had been working already before that happened. Yeah. I mean, could you see that our country was going to probably get involved in this worldwide conflict that was in Europe or, or something? Yeah, we, we knew it was coming, and uh, we, was, we were savvy enough to understand what was going on. And, uh, we're very, we're pretty scared actually. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know. We're kind of young and didn't know what was was going to happen to us. And Did you have a girlfriend at this time or anybody special? My wife. Oh, okay. So were you were you you were not married though then? No. Okay. No, so we, where we, did you, okay? We met wife? each other when I was seventeen and she was sixteen. In went, school or, or no? We met at a dance. I went together for three and a half years before you got my was four where, years. Where was the dance? No. In the Bronx. It was, in, it was in one of these homes that had a cellar, and they'd rent it out, and the boys had to pay a quarter a week, and the girls didn't have to pay anything. They could come in for free. But we had music uh, on, on a, what I want to call it, a record player. Yeah. You had to wind it up. Oh, yeah. So it was old Victor record player. <laughs> Victor and we danced. Just yeah. good, clean fun. And what was, your, uh, what was your wife's name, her maiden name? Her name was Miriam Schwartz. And uh, what did her dad, dad, father do? Her dad was a locksmith and also had a key shop also in the Bronx on 3rd Avenue. And where did her ancestors all come from? They also came from, from Russia. He actually, he escaped from Russia because uh, he was in the army. He was a deserter. And uh, he was really horrified at what he saw. And picked up his wife at that time. And they had one child and came to America. That would have been about what year then did they come over, you think? That would be very early 1900s, early 1900s. maybe 1900 itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he had the rest of his family here in America. He had four more children after that, my wife was one of them. And um, so after she got out of high school, what did she do? Did she go to work or, or school yeah. or what? She was in the same situation I was. She, Unfortunately, she was orphaned when she was two years old. Her mother passed away, and her dad couldn't keep her anymore, and he put her in an orphan asylum. And uh, she stayed there and bounced around from one home to another in foster homes. And by the time she was about 16 or 17, her sister, who quit school to take care of her, had an apartment. And she told her to come and live with her. And so she lived with between her and her aunt, that was her father's uh, sister, or sister-in-law. And she was brought up in these homes that uh, there were people, these people were strange to her. And then when we met, we went out together, and my mother just adored her, and 
she took my mother immediately and felt as though my mother were her own mother. And don't forget, I met her when she was 16. And she was working in downtown New York, and she worked in a place that uh, made rhinestone beads. They took a certain kind of glue which smelled horrible, and they attached it to this little bead and put it into a pin, a, bro a brooch. And she was making $12 a week at that time. And I think I was making a lot more than making 14 <laughs> And So what year were you drafted then? Into the I service? finally got drafted in 1944, beginning of 44. Were you uh, engaged at that time, or had you got married yet? Or, or what? No, we, did, we, we got married a year before that, 1943. Okay. Okay. We held off getting married because we worried about my getting drafted, but I kept getting one deferment after another. But we didn't have any children. We decided we're not going to have any children. So we married a little bit over a year when I finally got drafted. I got drafted August the 25th. And where did you go? Uh, Fort Dix. Fort Dix, New Jersey. New right? Jersey, right. Okay. And what was that like? Uh, I was not a, I was not a, a military person. It, to me, I, I couldn't stand military life. I hated to be uh, spoken to the way I was, and I didn't see a need for some of the stuff they did to you, it was a, for disciplinary action, I'm sure. But I couldn't, I couldn't uh, comprehend it. it. It wasn't for me, and I didn't like. I never liked the army. I always said, I, they came and got me. I didn't, I didn't come to them. I was drafted. Yeah. So when I got out of the army, which was two years later, I never joined anything. I didn't join any. Uh, I always said I wouldn't even join a Salvation Army. <laughs> Anything that had the name Army to it, I wouldn't join. Did you notice any discrimination when you were in the Army? Yeah. Unfortunately, yes, I did. And uh, I guess you know this, very few people did, but we never mixed the blacks with the whites, you know. Right. Or well, my wife never knew that until I came home. I meant discrimination against you as being there, a Jewish There was discrimination person. against Jewish, yes. Yeah. So I, I was held back in rank for a very long time for that very reason, because I had a captain who was a little bit anti-Semitic. He never said so, but he was. And I and two other Jewish boys in that outfit never got anywhere. As soon as he was gone, our ranks started to shoot up chevron after chevron. So where did you go from Fort Dix then? I went to, uh, I went to Fort Knox. I went to school. I went to, we went to General Motors was holding school because they were the ones that made the two engines that went into the engine transmission that went into this T-24 tank that was only in training at that time. Now do you, did you, did they take you there because of your background mm -hmm. working with machinery and stuff like that? Yeah. So you were glad, I mean, right. if you had to go they, anywhere. They knew that I was mechanically inclined. So I, I didn't, I was not a machine shop, but uh, I was in, in mechanical. So That's what uh, I did. were you pleased to go there if you had to go anywhere? Right? Yeah, I was very pleased. I, I liked what I was doing and uh, and the school I couldn't remember was called ICS. I don't know why it did in <laughs> Pennsylvania. I don't know why it flipped my mind. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, I had a very good background in mechanics and in generally all around. And uh, I did very well with them. And uh, once I got out of there and once I got away from this particular office, I started getting rank hand of a fist. And then when the uh, motor sergeant was heading up points to go home, they asked me if I would, at that time I was a staff sergeant, would I be, like to become motor sergeant? I said, of course. So I then was in charge of uh, 21 tanks, uh, had about eight, uh, I had about eight jeeps and half tracks and, and I had a, a whole company of men that, that I took care of. And it was a very, very nice position for me. And how did your men treat you that were you were under you? Lots of respect. Lots of respect. I, I, I knew I knew the tanks very well. And I knew my my uh, work very well, and I was able to train them, and they appreciated what we did together. And uh, I wasn't afraid of work. I worked all kind of crazy hours. Didn't matter whether we were able to quit or not for the night. I I stayed on until the job got done. Those tanks, what was their weak weakness as far as things you had to repair on them, pretty much? Or what, I mean, what, what would well, for one thing, we had a 37 millimeter gun on this little tank, which we could have had something bigger. It wouldn't pierce armor, but it was fast as could be, and one of the reasons we had that tank was we could, we could shoot at a German tank, 
and then zip around it. We had, and we also had 360 degree turret rotation, which they didn't, when they had a Mark IV, three or four, which is a very, very dangerous weapon because it had 88 on them. Yeah. If they wanted to turn that tank, that gun rather, they had to turn the whole tank. Their turret was very, very limited as to where they could turn. And uh, if they miss you the first time, better get out of the way. They're not gonna miss you the second time. And our weak spot for our tanks, I would say, was the fact that we didn't have enough firepower and we didn't have enough armor on them. We should have, could have had more armor. But, but mechanically, they held up pretty well. Oh, they were great. Those general motor transmission, you know, the, at that time, they were hydromatic transmission, which we didn't have too much of, automatic transmission, we called them. And the, the cars here in America were very new at that. They, they really didn't have them yet. And they did a superb job of putting them in the tanks and making them Really? I didn't, proficient. I didn't realize that. So you yeah. have pretty much an automatic transmission yeah, in, yeah. your, in your tanks, huh? Right. Well, I'll be done. And uh, when we wanted to work on them, if we had to do something very uh, serious, we pulled the whole engine, transmission and all, just yanked it right out with a crane and worked on the outside and stuck it back down in there again. <laughs> it was good. And your half tracks, a half track, um, explain what a half track is to us. Well, a half track has tracks and it also has wheels. Right. And it carries most of your uh, parts, mostly for your, it's a, it's a shop car. It's a so shop. Did it have a, yeah. any, a machine and, gun on it or any armor? Yeah, it did. Oh. But it wasn't really a, it wasn't really a, a fighting weapon. Uh, we used it for more or less, it was a, uh, a parts room and a, uh, a replacement depot on wheels, well on tracks I should call it. Mm -hmm. And the reason it was on a track, so it was a half track, because you had to go over this terrain that, that a, a jeep couldn't go over and trucks couldn't go over them. Consequently, every outfit had at least minimum two half tracks. And they supplied the uh, tanks with what the necessary. And if we needed uh, a lot of heavy stuff, such as, let's say we needed some carburetors and different things that we didn't carry, we had to get down to a different city and pick it up. And we had a centralized location where, where there was a depot and we would get everything we want for about a week's worth of supplies and parts and come back up again. And did you did you stay at Fort Knox until you went overseas? Mm -hmm. And what, what when did you go over? What month and what year? Uh, I got over there, let's see, 19. I have to think for a minute. You, uh, I was you, about you, November. Okay, because I oh, think yeah, you, November, you November, went and you, you uh, were a replacement you yeah, mentioned it was for, for uh, December. the ballot. So right. be around Christmas time. Around Christmas time. Before uh, Christmas. 44. Right, correct. Um, so how did you get, a, did you go on a, a troop ship or did, and did uh, your did yeah, the tanks and stuff a, go with you? Or we went on a Liberty you? ship. I went on a Sea Robin. I'll never forget it. What happened was we were a flotilla of 86 ships and the, the, uh, the Germans and the Japanese caught up to us and chased us about 400 miles off the coast of Africa. And this whole entire trip, we were throwing these depth charges to, out into the ocean trying to get them. Yeah. And if you're just a kid, and you hear, these, you hear this ship buckling the way ours did, and if you're not scared, then you're not human. <laughs> because I, I and everybody else was scared. And we were about eight or 900 guys in one place. You know, they, they packed us in like sardines. We went six high. Were you in a, in a um, flotilla or, I mean, a convoy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. We were a convoy of 86 ships oh, 86. with destroyers around us. Yeah, right. But uh, somehow they, these guys Separate broke through and... Did, they, did any of the ships go down or nope, did they take any hits? No, they didn't. Not, we, got them, we got one of them, okay. but they never got us. But we never knew anything, so they didn't tell us. All we kept hearing, like every, let's say every 30 seconds, the, the, the ship would buckle, you'd hit us the plates in the ship, which is buckling you, and shatter your ears, and I'm not scared, that's all I can tell you. Where did you leave the States? What port did you sail out of? Uh, I think I left in New Jersey. No, I don't remember anymore. Okay. I, know I, I know I landed in La Havre. I know that. Okay, La Havre, yeah. And, uh, and France. Yeah. Right. Uh, Worked our way through France. Yeah. Now, when you got there, uh, was the bulge that air, that, that was that going on at the time that you landed, or did, did no? We were. They had cleared the beaches at that time, right. and they kept us roughly eight miles behind fire, behind the enemy. Uh, 
-hmm. because they valued the equipment that we had, right. and especially service company who I was attached to. Uh, very seldom did we have to get up on the front line. What we had to do is, at nighttime, we had to go out and rescue some of these tanks that were disabled. Oh. And it was pretty tricky. We had to cut the Chevron tracks off and then pull them in with a wreck up. Oh. And put a, we used to put a tent over them so they wouldn't see that we had a, a, a torch, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to burn the ta tracks yeah. off. And we had to go out and rescue the, ta the tanks. And, and we had a lot of fire coming in, you know. But uh, somebody said to me recently, did you ever shoot anybody? Well, I wouldn't know. I shot, but I'm not so sure that I aimed at anybody. Okay. And what, what did you carry? What was your... Well, I had, a, I had, a, I had a, an M1 rifle, I had a carbine rifle, and a 50 caliber machine gun. Hmm. Then I had a grease gun over here on my side because you couldn't get in a turret otherwise. It was short, about this big. Uh -huh. oh, and okay. I got a couple medals for those guns. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we did things. Well, well, okay, let's go back to your Le Havre, Le Havre um, and w what route do you take as you go north? Or Went through uh, through Holland, Herlin, Falkenberg, Holland. And which army were you with? Were you, were I, you with I, was, I was with Patton's army, okay. and we were right. attached on a site to the 101st Airborne, oh. and, and the 86th, right. Lincoln, President Lincoln's outfit. Right, okay. And, uh, they kept moving us up from one depot to another. We uh, we never got permanently assigned. For, I would say for about three weeks, two or three weeks, when I finally got into the seven seventy first. When I was over there, I was just uh, just drifting. Mm -hmm. I was just a replacement, repo depot they called it. Okay. And uh, we you know we had to avoid. How many tanks did they have? Say, uh, oh, we had uh, we had about sixty tanks plus a bunch of uh, tank destroyers, plus a few wreckers and tank okay, carriers. Tell me, what, what is a tank destroyer? It's one that can pierce armor. Is, is, said, it, is it like a half-track? No, nope. it a, it's a tank with a bigger gun. Oh. It, it's a Sherman tank. Oh, Sherman. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it was, uh, it was built for, for offensive and defensive, both. That was the tanks we had. Okay. So. We were, we were assigned to those tanks, and and what were the the tank drivers, the, the tank guys? What were they like? What, I mean, were they just like everybody they else? Were, most they of them were little... PFCs, and they were like anybody else. That their job was to drive a tank, and we had uh, four men in a tank. We had uh, one on each side, a system tank driver and a tank driver. And then we had a usually we had a, a guy at the turret looking out, but most of the time it was a, a lieutenant. And, uh, and they could communicate among themselves and we, the yeah, we did what, what we call sound power. We had, we had battery operated units called sound power. Didn't need any electricity. We could talk to each other and communicate with each other and they would tell us which way to go and how many tanks they wanted to come up to the front and stuff like that. Did you, did you lose many tanks? Yeah. We and lost, at one point, at one point must have lost about a third of what we had. And I assume all if you disabled. If you all disabled. Plus the oh, men in them. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, if you lose, if a tank goes yeah, up, uh, I mean, the guys are probably. That was one of my bit of worst experiences when I had to help the medics get some guys out of a tank where they threw a hand grenade in. Yeah. I never talk about it. I haven't spoken since I come home. I don't ever want to think about it again. I, it happened, and that's the way it was. Right. So, and you yourself, you got fairly close to the well I mean, at night. Obviously, you're you're, but uh, when uh, a lot of action, we were going, in a line of fire, you know. But um, I was never facing. I, I honestly never faced a line of Germans right, yeah. that I know of. But we were shot at, shot at, and bombed. We were strafed, bombed, everything. And you would return fire. Periodically, yeah, just and then when we when we returned the fire, we returned by radio. We we weren't even sure what we were shooting at. We were just told what direction to shoot, where to shoot, and so on and so forth. And my nearest, uh, sorry, my nearest thing that happened to me was I was on a motorcycle when when the town was supposedly cleared out in Osterveld, a little town, and somehow I 
I hear this whizzing bullet go by me. Right? We're wearing a helmet. And I looked up in time to see a, a curtain go down in somebody's house. There was a sniper there. And by the grace of God, he didn't hit me. And so we kept on going. And that, that would have been, was that in Belgium or? No, Germany? that was in Germany. In Germany. Yeah. Okay. So when you got up to uh, the Bastogne, uh, Belge area. Um, central, central Germany. Well, I know, but I mean, yeah. in, in Belgium there, um, then you, did you cross, where did you cross the Rhine? Uh, I was trying to think, was Metz. Was it a, a bridge you went across? Yeah, it, the, was a, it was a bridge built by us. A pontoon, or what do you Pontoon bridge. Yeah. We had put it down, because we had blown the other bridges out. Yeah. We blew everything out of the site. And, uh, so you could go across that with tanks without yeah. much trouble? Yeah, we could get a tank across it. Though, believe it or not, those bridges used to work overnight. We would put them up, we'd start about uh, 4 in the afternoon. By the morning, we brought tanks across them. Amazing. I often think today when I drive around a city, why don't we put a, get, get the Corps of Engineers put a bridge up here? Because <laughs> that's what we did. What was it like for you when you first experience getting shot at and bombed and stuff like that. I mean, uh, were... Very, very frightened. I, I swore that I would never see home again. I was convinced that I was never going to return to my family. I, I had to do that because that was the mental attitude I had to keep. That I'm never going to get home anymore, so I'm here to fight the war and I'm going to fight it. Because I didn't, I didn't really believe I'd ever see my family. Many of us didn't, you know, and when you see things like that happen, you see guys all over you in different positions, you know, it's not, not good. And you think to yourself, well, I'll probably be one of them anyway. But luckily I was not. Did you correspond with your wife and people back, uh, family back every, home a I, lot? I was a prolific writer. I wrote every opportunity I had. She never got half the stuff I wrote. They'd cut half it out. But I did write did email you? and or stuff like that. Do you that. still have some of those uh, letters that you wrote back? I have a carton at home that I haven't looked at for 40, yeah. 50 years. Well, we need to, we need to get some, look at some of that stuff. I've never even opened them up. I'm not sure if they're weather beat, brown in color, or tan, or what they are anymore. Because you couldn't say anything. You know, you, you talked around yeah. in circles. They but all, I always thought I was safe and you know, had hope to get home someday. When you were in Germany, did you happen to go to any of the camp, the uh, concentration camps? We liberated one of them. You did? Yeah. Well, let me put it this way. Somebody else had liberated, but we got there in time to help these people, give them direction. They were following the railroad track because they didn't know where to go. And we gave them candy and V rations and C rations. And they looked like walk. I wrote that in my letters. I said, I see these people walking with, like, they look like cellophane on their body because we didn't have saran wrap. But they had, they were they were gaunt, they were like bone. They were just walking skeletons, and they were they were hollow cheeks and no arms. And, and I, I guess I got there about half a day after they were finally come out of the camp, and uh, there was tons of them. I mean, just hundreds of them and hundreds of them. And uh, they most of them couldn't speak because they were so they could they had no strength to speak. They had, had not had any food, nothing. I were walking skeletons. Um, at that time, I wrote that I, I see people with cellophane that look like they have cellophane over their body because they were skin, just skin and bone. Mm -hmm. Do you remember which camp that was? No, I'm trying to think where that was. And I don't it, know which one it was. Uh, do you think it was it might have been outside they, of Stuttgart? Did they keep a lot of the Jewish people there and, and stuff? I mean, they were, were they mostly predominantly mostly po Jewish. Political prisoners yeah. as opposed to the POWs. Yeah, predominantly Jewish, but the, surprisingly people didn't know this, but there were a lot of a lot of Christian people as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't discriminate, you know, against Jews only. They, they picked on everybody. Yeah, anybody didn't go yeah, along anybody with that. Yeah, anybody they thought wasn't going to be on their side, they just threw them in a the camp and killed them. The, the, the atrocities, I have been in some of those camps. And you can't believe what what human person did to another. Just unbelievable that we even think of these things. And where were you when the war in Europe ended? I was in uh, Munster, which was not 
the American territory yet, and we had a move from there to Munich. Uh, we had a split up. We split up between the Russians and the French, and the English, and we have we were in English territory, and we had a move to uh, Munster, I think it was, or Munich rather, and we crossed over from Hamburg, and uh, we, we first. We first settled in Hamburg when they said that the war was over. They declared over, and I was, I think it was April, and I was like, uh, we, we all got drunk. <laughs> I can <gotta> tell you, <laughs> we were drinking buzz bomb juice. You know, <laughs> my lieutenant went out and got this stuff in a, in a five-gallon tank and filled it up. And we put in some burnt lemon and sugar and just got stoned. Did you get any leave time at all uh, up until this no, point? No, because they there? told us we're going to have to go to Japan. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, no. I meant prior to that, uh, no. or were you just in action the whole time? There was no, you didn't. Yeah, get I was in action. All, and yeah, I wasn't in action all the time. I was there. <laughs> I, I was doing, uh, I was doing, uh, what do you call it, the car duty and stuff like that. Yeah, right. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, the action stopped when it was stopped. And so, when did you get to come back to the States then? I had to come back until the following July, or well, June actually. Okay. But uh, I was, I was, I got out on July 4th. So, that time you were just kind of on a police action or, 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 a guard or just uh, occupation? Well, I was doing occupation duty for a right. year and a half, 18 months. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Tell us about who you met when you were in France, who you met. Oh, well, there was an incident that happened to me when I was in France. I had actually been staying in a place called Nancy, which is outside of Paris. And being a motor sergeant, I had access to Jeeps so I could go into town anytime I wanted. And if a lieutenant or an officer wanted to get a Jeep, he'd have to give me the time off. So I had both a Jeep and a weekend off. So I drive into Paris, and, but this time it was in Belgium. <clears throat> and I'm sitting at a place called G.I. Joe's. And my wife had given me a, an identification bracelet with my name on it and my serial number. And I'm sitting there, and the girl served me this soft drink, was a malted. And she looked at my wrist. She says to me, how do you say that name? And I said, Miliband. She says, you know, I have a very good friend whose name is Miliband. She said, you have any family over here? I said, I don't think I have any in Belgium, but I have them in Paris. She said, well, she said, that, that girl's name is Miliband. I, I think you guys must be related. She said, would you like to meet her? I said, yes. So I said, but I got to go back, and I can't come back till next week. So I came back, and she arranged for a phone conversation first between us. And then the girl put her mother on, and I spoke to her mother, and her mother asked me what my dad's name was, and I told her, and she almost fell off, dropped the telephone. My dad had been her boyfriend back in Europe yet, back in, in Poland, before they even came to Brussels. And he had dated her. And I, I make a long story short, I uncovered the entire family, in both in France and in Belgium, which we're still in contact today. <laughs> today. And my cousin, whose name is David Miliband, he's about a fourth cousin of mine. Just, he was in, he's in the uh, British Parliament. He's an MP with his brother. He was just named the Foreign Minister of Britain really? by, by, uh, by, by Brown. Yeah. So. The family is pretty well known yeah, over there. I guess there. so. Gosh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I think yeah we, we had newspaper clipping. <laughs> We're very proud of that. I guess so. And his, uh, his younger brother, who's only 37, is, is a, an advisor to all of the, the parliament. Uh, he was at under, under, under uh, uh, what's Blair. Blair. Tony Blair. Yeah, thank you, Tony Blair. Yeah. Yeah. And so he just passed on to the new prime minister yeah. and mm -hmm. got this position. So. They're yeah, very, very, like, very good boys. Yeah, I guess so. Anyway, I did. I, I uncovered the whole entire family, which we're still in touch with. And every time I go to Paris, we go see them and we talk, and they come here and yeah. or had to go 3,000, 4,000 miles to meet somebody. <laughs> That's wonderful. So uh, how did you get back to the States then? Well, we came back. The same thing was a Liberty ship, and I couldn't, I'm not a good uh, traveler. I get air sick and I get seasick, and I, they give me about two or three hundred people I was in charge, maybe 250 because of my rank, and I spent my whole time flat on the deck <laughs> telling what I wanted to have done. I, I couldn't get up for 16 days. I had a beard, 
-hmm. And we went past the Statue of Liberty and brought tears to my eyes. Mm -hmm. And finally got into Fort Dix and got out about four days later. They, you know, they put you through a lot of rigmarole. They try to make you enlist and try to make you stay back. And my captain back there in Berlin, I was in Berlin 15 months. My captain talked to my wife on the phone and tried to make me stay there. And he wanted to make me a warrant officer, but I wasn't interested. My only question to him was, do I have enough points to go home? Is it my time? He said, yes. And I said, I'm leaving. Well, uh, okay, tell me a little bit about, you were in Berlin for like 15 months mm -hmm. on occupation. Did occupation. Um, did you have much interaction with the uh, Brit the, Ber the Berliners? The yeah, not the, the Berliners, yes, and a lot with the Russians too, because we had a trade. They had all the That's what I was uh, coal over there, we had all the glass and stuff like that. But I did, I, I got to speak German. I learned how to speak German, and because I was in charge of all these people working for me, they built uh, they built a garage for me for my tanks, and I had a secretary who spoke both English and German, and uh, we got along very well, because there was never a, there was never a Nazi, you know, as far as they were concerned. We always said it was the same hand that was this way it was now this way, it made no difference. You couldn't find the Nazi over there anymore, so I did, but. Uh, we had more to do with the Russians than we did with the British because we were not near the British area. And uh, the, we well, found how out. Was, what was your relationship with the Russians? Well, we day? found out they were very uneducated people. They practically had no bulletin boards because they couldn't read. For them, everything had to be set on a PA system. We had this one guy that came in and killed a little girl because he wanted her to play music on a typewriter. He thought it was a piano. And he kept telling him, and she didn't understand him. He finally killed her. They got him, thank God, they got him. They took him away, but he was Russian. And they were known for drinking vodka, and they sure did drink vodka. Like, I couldn't believe how they could drink a whole full glass of vodka straight. They, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they kept their reputation with us. They didn't hide it. So when you came back, uh, so what did you do uh, after you got out? I went back to at and I went back to the phone company who had my job for me. They said to me, I, I thought I was going to go collect unemployment insurance, you know. They said to me, no, go down, to the, go down to the payroll department. We have something down there for you. And I went down there. They had four weeks worth to pay for me. So I couldn't collect anything. And then they told me to wait a while. They're going to put a department there yet because I was already a supervisor. So they did. They, they called me to put a department together, and I stayed there another three more years. And then I decided to leave because good friends of mine who worked with me together were there for 19 years and 18 years. And uh, they come to him one day and said, "You're moving to Point Breeze, or you're moving to Chicago, and we'll move your family later. You're going to be there by Friday." I thought to myself, "Wendy was born. I figured is that all there is after 20 years? I, I'm not going to stay in this company." So I went out, and went into the business myself. And I stayed in business for the rest of my life. Doing what? Yeah. Doing what? Doing, I didn't do so well the first three years. <laughs> but I did do well after that. But what kind of business did you I did engineering, tool designing. Oh, uh -huh. I, I did all kind of precision parts stuff. I had an exclusive uh, agreement with uh, Rand McNally. They had no engineering department, so I did all their engineering and designing for them in big map cases and different things that came out of the ceiling for big corporations that wanted to see things come out of the ceiling in their boardroom. I had a wonderful relationship with the whole family of the McNallys. And I went out to have a very successful business. Okay. I think I'm going to have Wendy go over. I think it's a good time. Why don't you go sit next to your dad there, since we just got your name mentioned there. So, Wendy, when did you uh, get become part of all this? Well, I was born in uh, June, June 4th, 1947. Okay, that's right. We just looked at the magazine. Right, didn't exactly. We? <laughs> And um, uh, did you do you have any brothers and sisters? I do. I have a brother who's uh, five years uh, younger than me. And what's Our his brother, name? Joel. Joel. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, where did you guys grow up? Then? Well, um, for the first uh, eight years, uh, we lived in New York, and then um, New York City. In New York City, and by that time, uh, my dad had uh, moved his business out to New Jersey, uh, near the George Washington Bridge. And so um, they, we bought a house. They bought a house in the suburbs of Paramus. Do you remember the street address of that house? 128 
<laughs> Village Circle West, right? <laughs> and uh, we were about, uh, I'd say maybe 20 minutes from New York City. It was in Bergen County. It was a great community to grow up in. And uh, we, um, we just loved it. It just was wonderful because we had a yard, we could play outside, there were woods across the street, we could just have a, have a great place to, to uh, grow up in. And where did you go to school? Great school? I went to, uh, well, by the time we moved, it was, uh, I was in third grade, I think, and so I went to the public schools there in, uh, in New Jersey. Yeah. Do you remember the name of them? Um, ooh, gosh. I, one of them, I think, was Ridge, Ridgefield, Ridgewood School. Where'd you go to high school? I went to Paramus High School, and uh, all again, just you know, minutes away from right. from where we lived. Uh, we were just so centrally located. Do you remember any of your teachers that were favorite teachers you had in high school? Oh gosh, um, see, he has such a better memory than I do. <laughs> I, I don't, but I'll tell you a funny story about a teacher, okay. and, and here I am not remembering their names, but uh, it was a back-to-school night in high school, and she was our uh, English teacher. And she stood up in front of the room, all the parents were there, and the kids, and uh, everybody had, you know, name tags on. And she introduced herself. She said, welcome, and I'm Mrs. And she had to look down at her name tag. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> and now I can't even yeah. remember her name. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so um, um, then did you go to, what did you do after high school? You went to college? I went to college. I went to uh, Ithaca College, right. which is in upstate New York in uh, the same town as Cornell. Right, that's right. And uh, we had a favorite saying. We always said that uh, we overlooked. Cornell University, uh -huh. so yeah. we, we felt ourselves kind of superior so, to yes. them, okay. but of course Cornell had the reputation. And your husband Bob, where did you guys meet? Uh, Bob and I met, uh, it was the second day of my uh, senior year, and a good in, friend in of mine high in, high in high school, I should say high school, uh -huh. and a good friend of mine uh, said that uh, she wanted to go out that weekend but her boyfriend didn't have a car, but his cousin had a car. And uh, he, his cousin said, well, if you get me a date, I'll take you, I'll take you out. So they set up a date, but we were supposed to go to the stock car races on a Saturday night, but he wanted to check me out first. So he said, let's get together on Friday night. And so we had a date on Friday night and uh, my parents always liked to tell me that uh, when uh, when I came down the steps, they were they were looking at Bob, and he was his eyes just got really big, and he was, I guess, pleased with what he saw. Yeah, I would, I would think so. I would think so. Um, and you have how many children? We have two children. Our son Jared uh, was born in 1972, and he's going to be 35 in uh, December. And what does he do? And uh, Jared uh, has his uh, his MBA degree in marketing and advertising, and he's been working at uh, Sharp Hospital Systems for about uh, five years now. He's a, a manager there, and uh, he loves he loves his work. And in fact, he just got honored. They do documentaries once a year, and he was one of the producers. And they, he just got a regional Emmy for his work on the documentary. So we're very proud of him. And your daughter? And our daughter, Beth, uh, was born in 1976. And uh, so she's going to be 32 in February. And she also just got her uh, Master of Fine Arts degree and she just started working. She got a job at Fullerton Community College as their curator of their uh, permanent art collection and she teaches uh, art history classes and we're very proud of her too. Bernie, uh, when did you uh, retire? 1973. And so what did you do after that? Well I played golf for a whole year <laughs> and then 
the kids wanted to start something, so I promised them I'd give them one day a week. And the one day a week became two days a week, and the two day became four. And that my, was the beginning of my desert business machine career. And so my retirement didn't last as long as I thought it would. But I was, I thought I could just sit back and do nothing, but I realized I couldn't do that. I'm a type A. And luckily for me, I, my wife, financially we didn't have to work anymore. We had enough finance to go on the rest of our life. But we found the need to do things. So my wife got involved with Desert Business Machines together with me, with Wendy and Bob, and we started it. Okay, okay, now, so when so you when did you move here permanently? Oh, I had a home here already. I, I was oh. just flying back and forth with my wife in Palm Springs. We had a home when we lived back in New Jersey. Even out here then? Out in Palm Springs. Oh, we bought our property in 1959. Oh. How did you, and, and how, why did you come here in the first my place? My uncle was out here, oh. and uh, he was in Whittier. Mm -hmm. And my sister-in-law was out here, my wife's sister, and she wanted to just come out and visit. So we came and visited, and my uncle said to me, run away to Las Vegas. He says, there's, there's one place you've got to see before we go to Las Vegas. He said, you've got to see this place called Palm Springs. So we drove to Palm Springs, fell in love with it, got home, told my uncle, buy me a piece of property, because someday I want to retire there. He did that. <laughs> and so that's exactly what happened. Okay. So we started building in 1968. And when it was finished, my wife and I would come out here for the winter. We'd come here in January and stay until Mother's Day. I go back east one, one week out of the month, and then finally we used to drive home, so it was nice. <laughs> and so you came out here, and uh, you why were you here? Did you come with them, or when they They were using here? my house and didn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to go back east anymore. Right. Well, he, my dad and mom said that, um, well, we wanted to be where that we knew they were going to be retiring, and we we had been out here a few times and we loved it too and uh, and my folks said Palm Springs is great and anything you want to do there you know people are there to retire so if you're there to work you're gonna find plenty of people that will use your services and so Bob had been a uh, copier salesman for four years in New Jersey so when we came here that was sort of the natural thing to do and uh, and I had um, I had gotten my degree in um, speech pathology and audiology, and I was thinking that that's what I would do uh, once the kids grew up. So, but in the meantime, I said, well, I'll help out a little bit in the business. And, a little bit. <laughs> and here I am, 33 <laughs> years later, so. Are you still involved in the business, Bernie? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I still go in. Okay. Any other activities that you like to Well, do? I'm very active in my temple, as I told right. you. I was president, yeah. and that kept me hopping for five years. And other than that, I love to travel. And I've been around the world, more or less. And uh, I just, that, that's my hobby. And I did, is, is your wife still living? No, I lost her almost 10 years now, this January. Sorry. We were married 54 years, almost 55. Yeah. And uh, we miss her. But that's life. Yeah, it's nice to have be close to family, though. Yeah, so. I like it. I like things the way they are now. Yeah. We're a very close family. We are. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like it. Too. That's yeah. that's obvious. I think we're probably getting pretty close to where we can start wrapping this. Any uh, any further thoughts from either of you before we close here? Well, I just wanted to say I I've had. Uh, I've wanted to do this ever since you told me you were doing this, and that goes back a number of years. And I'm just so pleased um, because my dad has just such an interesting past, and, and I wanted to have this for myself, for my kids, and for the rest of the family. And it's especially special right now because he just celebrated his 85th birthday. And he's just the most wonderful, most generous person person that I know and um, he's taking all of us on a, on a long weekend cruise down to Ensenada in celebration of his birthday and um, so I mean that's just one of about a thousand things that he's done he's helped so many people in his life really many many people and and anybody who knows him and and my mom knows what special people they are so I love you so much. And Thank you, sweetie. Well, I thanks feel for doing way. this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, Bernie, 
I want to thank you for your service you. to our country. And thanks for coming in and sharing with us today. And Wendy, and, you and too. I don't honey. feel, Dave, that I did anything more so than any other young man did. That was our thing to do, and we did it. Yeah, well, that's, I, that's a unit. Never, I, my, my daughter will tell you, I never speak about the war. I, I put my uniform in the trunk, and that's where it stayed. Okay. I said more here today than I've said in 50 years. Well, I'm glad you said it, because it needed to be said, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank again. you very much for doing this. Right. I appreciate it. Sure. Okay.